Um, this is a wonderful, uh, nice, intimate group, um, and I'm happy to be here. Um, if anyone wants to stop me, I'm not a lecturer that needs to kind of just go. So if you need to stop me and ask a question, I love that. So please feel free to do so. Um, but really, I'm here uh, to really uh, talk about um, so many of the wonderful things that we have coming up. And it's a huge rarity um, that we're entering into in our area. When I say our area, I'm talking about the New England in general. Um, the National Ceramics Conference, which has a, a become a huge deal. The last time it was in our area in 1984, I believe there were 60 people. Jim, am I about right? I think it was very, very few people. Now uh, we're talking between five and 6,000 people that come to that conference every year. And it's hosted by a different city every year, um, although New Bedford is far too small to host it. Um, Providence is hosting it this coming year in 2015. Um, and uh, we've been really fortunate to um, put some glue to that event for them. Um, so what I'd like to do tonight is just to kind of uh, wet your, your senses a little bit on, on that coming up and some of the things that this museum has uh, very graciously um, given us their time and their energy and their space to put forth uh, some exhibitions and some events that literally will never happen again. Um, it's kind of a once-in-a-lifetime event, so I'm really happy to be talking about that today. Um, so uh, there's actually quite a few of you that I don't know, and I'm happy to see that. It's pretty rare these days uh, when I talk locally, but so uh, welcome. Um, my name is Seth Rainville, and I have been a potter since, uh, professionally since 1998. Um, and I went to UMass Dartmouth when the Star Store campus was not the Star Store campus. It was still a broken down building. And we, we were at the Purchase Street campus, which is a different broken down building, um, across from Glazer Glass, uh, where, is where our studio was back in the day. And that's when I fell in love with New Bedford. Um, the, the idea that one could create masterworks in such an environment was always kind of intriguing to me. Um, and that love affair continued, even though in 1998 I actually left for Arizona, where I spent uh, over a decade um, teaching and uh, honing my skills and, and furthering my career. Um, I always uh, loved this area. So what I'd like to do to start off is kind of draw you a timeline. And I'll start by showing you some of my work. Um, I work. Uh, for many, many years, and actually when I entered into school, I was a painter. Um, oil painting was my passion and what I loved to do. I did a lot of drawing, some printmaking, uh, woodblock prints, uh, line of cuts, etc. Um, but I always, uh, ever since I was a kid, would go to Sturbridge Village and my parents would use the free uh, babysitter, which was the potter at Sturbridge Village. Um, and they literally would just like throw me in the door and they would go shopping for four hours. And they'd come back, and I'd still be asking the guy questions covered in slip and stuff. And the guy would always be like, take your kid out of here. Um, and it's all I ever wanted to do. You know, my, my father was one of the better known photographers in the country. And, and he always, I think, expected maybe me to become a photographer. And he was fine that I didn't. But um, I believe the word he's, words he said was, oh, great, you picked a, a more dying art form than mine. Um, <laughs> And that, of course, he supported me greatly after that. But um, I fell in love with clay uh, because of, of literally uh, one man uh, when I entered into UMass Dartmouth. His name was Chris Gustin, who unfortunately is not here tonight, but um, I hope you all know who he is. Um, he was my teacher in college, and he made one simple statement in a 3D class that I was taking. He said, well, Seth, just think of clay as a three-dimensional canvas. And that was it. That's all I needed to hear. Um, Chris Gustin. G-U-S-T-I-N. You'll see some more about him shortly. Um, and so I really started to investigate the idea that clay could tell a story in the round. Okay, um, uh, I do suffer some slight uh, dyslexia, and, and, and part of that is, is um, seeing things in three dimensions kind of all the time. Um, I read very, very close. Even though I have perfect vision, I still wear reading glasses. Um, I know it all sounds very strange, but um, there's something that immediately calmed me down about holding a teapot in my hand and being able to make a brush stroke over it. Um, and that really kind of just uh, 
made me um, at peace with my creative endeavors and made me want to do it more. Um, and ever since that day, all I've been doing is responding to uh, the life that I have and the surroundings that I'm um, part of, whether it was in Arizona, um, living here in New Bedford, in Dartmouth, um, and any of the other places I've lived around the country. Um, I've always tried to have that culture and that, uh, that uh, the weather and everything kind of just seep into me and kind of come out through the work. Um, but clay has always been the avenue to do that. Um, yes, every piece is a story. Every piece uh, has its own identity. I never reproduce an object the same ever. Um, that's why I can charge what I charge. Uh, but I want to make sure that um, wherever this piece ends up, however long it lasts throughout the history of time, that when people engage it, um, they can start to decipher who we are as a people, who I was as an artist, et cetera, et cetera. So being here in a museum always kind of makes me feel that, you know, what's going to happen someday with my work? Um, hopefully there's no volcanoes nearby. Um, so uh, let me go back to that slide before. I work primarily in porcelain. These pieces are porcelain, uh, but they are fired in what's called a wood kiln. <clears throat> wood kilns uh, use wood, actual wood, as fuel. Um, and you're basically stoking or throwing wood onto a fire for 24 hours a day, every three minutes or so, sometimes quicker. Um, and in our case, seven straight days, we do that. So you have to be slightly psychotic, have a lot of coffee, um, and a lot of patience. Um, and what happens is, is that fuel and that wood ash and that environment leaves uh, a re what I'd like to call a residue or a skin uh, that fuses with the clay to create these wonderful umbers and oranges and other colors. Um, so for someone like myself that draws and places imagery on clay, when you put it in a wood kiln, I would say I have about 50% loss every firing where the wood ash and all of the effects have destroyed the drawings that I've put on the piece. But all it takes is that one that is perfect uh, it, in its own uh, malfunctioning way. For instance, this piece on the right I really, really love. It's a, uh, based on a poem by E.E. E. Cummings called The Secret of Truth. Um, and just enough of the poem got destroyed in the firing. It's actually in the middle section on the left. There's nothing there. And that was the rest of the poem. And the fact that the wood edited the part of the poem that I don't particularly like is great. <laughs> um, and what's really great is that on the bottom is my father's favorite saying, it is what it is. And I hate that saying. But it's clear as day on the damn piece, OK? <laughs> um, and so those are the things that, that I really look for when I'm making work, is to engage the viewer. The work that I did for many years before getting into wood firing heavily, um, and still do today, this is a very recent piece um, that's now at the American Museum of Ceramics in California in their permanent collection. Um, this is called Lovely Memento. Um, and it's uh, on the same exact clay body you just saw, but this is clay in a um, high fire reduction kiln, a gas fired kiln, that does not introduce any foreign material. So the porcelain stays very white, um, and the drawings come out very clear. So the only problems I have is when I misspell something, <laughs> which I have done, and you will see later on. Um, so my wife, who's an attorney, I have her edit all of my pieces before they go in the kiln. Thank God for her. Um, and again, this is all, uh, even though um, I'm not necessarily responding to the Whaling Museum collection in this piece. You see that I use a lot of uh, ocean imagery. Uh, there's, um, I have a lot of very strange dreams. This, uh, the side with the young girl playing with the umbrellas flying in the air, um, dancing on the chair, is a dream I had about my daughter. Um, so this, literally, this whole piece is based on that dream I had about her. Um, hence, you had to be there in the flying airplanes, because that was also part of it. Um, the other side is actually uh, telling the story about uh, kind of moving home and having that kind of reflective, it's going to be OK. We're back in Yankee country. We'll be all right. There's no more sun. We'll be OK. <laughs> the day has ended at 3 o'clock. It'll be OK. Um, so again, uh, telling stories, doing, uh, uh, dealing with my surroundings. In this case, uh, the, the cup on the top left is called This is Power. Um, it's a young uh, New Bedford mother holding her child um, 
and uh, New Bedford uh, skyline in the background, but there's a Zeppelin flying over the top of it for some reason. Um, so I'll edit things just to make them more fun in my opinion. Uh, the bottom right teapot is called Ready, Set, Go, one of, one, one of my favorites, um, also based on a dream um, where I'm in my bathrobe with my wife just kind of floating on this really weird waterway and she kept just repeating to me, ready, set, go, ready, set, go, ready, set, go, ready, set, go. Um, I really, uh, my daughter got into Victorian paper theaters that you can buy online. I didn't know you could do this. And they cut out the paper theaters and you fold them out and they become this amazing thing and she'll play with them for hours, which is great. Um, so I started doing these theater pieces, um, which I really, really love. They're relatively new. Um, to, but again, responding to my environment, uh, the cup on the left actually uh, says Viagem on the inside uh, banner, which is voyage in Portuguese. So I'm starting, my wife's Portuguese, and I'm trying to really kind of engage in that culture here. Although I'm a classic French Canadian, I'm working on it. Um, uh, these are much, much older pieces. These are actually from Arizona, but they're, they're similar themes to a kind of a New England landscape, uh, a New England home. So I thought I would show these today. I haven't showed this slide in a long, long time. Those were from about 2002. Um, so there's this top teapot is a, a commission that I did that I misspelled two words on. Again, my dyslexia is ridiculous and, and they didn't realize it until they came out of the kiln and I delivered it to the collector. And it happened to be a huge collection in Arizona, um, the Petersons, if anyone knows who's, who's, uh, who, who's, who they are. And she very kindly called me and asked me to come pick it up and make her another one. She pointed it out and uh, she now has the the new version of it, uh, which looks almost identical to this, and my parents actually have the teapot with the misspelled words on it. Um, I like to show these. Uh, I don't show them very often, but these are uh, platters that I did. Um, uh, I did a series of about 50 of these, and they're, they're huge. They're about like that. Um, and they're thrown in two pieces so, uh, so that I can mani manipulate the center of them and push out the clay where the figures are. So I always figure out the drawings before I actually do the pieces. Um, and the one on the bottom right is the very first time in Arizona that I did um, a very specific story about a New Bedford couple. Um, a friend of mine that fishes in New Bedford um, lost his job and really lost it and um, wasn't fishing anymore. And he had tons of money in the bank. He was actually very good about it. Um, he never had a drinking problem, he never had a drug problem, and he stopped fishing because he got fired and he ended up committing suicide. It was awful. Um, and it just really, it really, really affected me in such a harsh way. Um, and we were moving home shortly after that, so I did this kind of whole um, kind of idea about looking to the future and seeing the past in your rear view um, and holding on as tightly as possible. You see him holding on to the rope rim there. Um, and his wife, girlfriend in the background is kind of looking at him like, you know, you're a loser, you're a loser. Um, but it was a very powerful, pow powerful piece for me. Um, and a, a major collector in Arizona bought the piece and it ended up being in uh, a publication, a book shortly after that. And it's funny because I, I never thought it was that successful. I actually thought the platter on the top left was much more successful and that's the one that got declined. So I always like to show this to students because um, Sometimes you have no idea what your own work is worth. Uh, these are very recent pieces from a show in Boston um, that was this past summer. Um, and they're responding again, uh, the top left teapot is responding to the idea of um, kind of floating in, in, uh, in a world that you're unsure of. So this guy is actually reclining in a teacup, floating in troubled waters. And the teapot is actually cut in half uh, with this theater on the inside, so you still can pour it, so half of it is still complete in the back. And the theater in the front shows a woman holding a baby um, in a, a windy, uh, windswept day, uh, waiting for her husband to come home. And the empty chair in front represents uh, all the nights and days that I'm stuck at the studio and my kids are waiting for me to come home to read them stories. Um, so that was a great piece, and, and some really wonderful people bought that, and I'm really happy that they own it. The piece on the bottom right um, uh, is called The Time Is Now, and was based on a painting that I did when I was a teenager um, called Someday We'll Do This, and it was about flying paper airplanes with my meme on Cape Cod. We used to fly paper airplanes with the barn swallows on the beach, and they would dive bomb the airplanes. Um, and I did that with my daughters uh, this past uh, summer, and so I 
did this piece called The Time Is Now, based on that. This is the piece that's, that's here. Uh, it's The Lazy Boy. Um, and the actual title of the piece is Rearranging the Deck Chairs on the Lazy Boy. Um, and you can actually rearrange the chairs. And there were 12 chairs, and the rest of them got stolen at the show. But that's what you get for asking people to, to touch, please touch. Um, but I kind of love that. Um, so you can see there's more chairs in the picture than are here today. Um, so really, the reason I wanted to show you my work first and kind of give you an idea of who I am creatively is to express to you how I got to this point where I'm involved in any of this. Um, so when my wife and I moved home, uh, by the way, we got married here at the Whaling Museum. Uh, we were living in Arizona, but our family was here, so we needed to find a place at home to, to uh, get married, and, and it was wonderful. And I've always had a, a dear affection for this place, and I'm happy to be uh, involved with it again. Um, but I really, really uh, am unlike a lot of artists. I like to be around people. Um, I love to be in creative environments where there's lots of people creating stuff. I'm not that guy that needs to make plates in the woods and not talk to people and be antisocial, um, like many of my colleagues. Um, so this is how I get involved in all this stuff. So Top Left Picture is a show I did in Newport a few years ago that went great. And I met a bunch of people that I got involved with in Sika shortly after that show. So I like to show that show because that show connected me with a lot of people that now are helping with the community of ceramic artists. Um, the top right is my gallery that I had right up the street here in, in New Bedford for years called Navio. Um, it was very successful and fun. Um, we decided to close it when both my business partner and I had kids and decided we couldn't be at the gallery 70 hours a week anymore. Um, but there, I certainly met an incredible amount of people and that was a, really a time where we proved to New Bedford that it was better than, than what people claimed it to be. We showed internationally acclaimed artists. We had the Smithsonian come and visit us. The Renwick Alliance came and visited us on a collector's tour. Um, we did an incredible amount of business from people outside of the area, primarily from Providence. And guess where Antic is going to be? In Providence. So I started making so many connections with a lot of the art crowd in Providence while owning that gallery. So I like to show that slide. Bottom left is the New Bedford Art Museum where I was a curator for two and a half years. Um, and loved putting the pieces of the puzzle together. And loved finding ways to not only show art, but to get people to invest in art. So it was all about, at that time when I was there, raising money so we could renovate the place, put new floors in, put a new coat of paint on there, get some bigger, better shows. Um, and we did that, and we started a collector's uh, uh, series of shows, which Jane, who's here, helped me with, and uh, continued from th this past summer was the fourth? Third. Um, so this was uh, one of the shows that I had curated there, and it was a lot of fun. Um, and then, of course, the bottom right, which is kind of like my home base, is um, the wood kiln out at Chris Gustin's uh, house, or what was his house now was just his studio. Um, that kiln was my kiln building class in college. And it's now gone on to be quite a famous kiln throughout the clay community. Um, and the people that you meet there are pretty outstanding. This is uh, me talking to Arnie Zimmerman and Chris, and um, Lucian Kuntz is in the background there. And um, on any given day, if you show up at that firing, which anyone's welcome to come anytime you want, um, you can run into some pretty famous people and some pretty amazing and inspiring people. And it's why I love being there. I mean, Jim Lawton, who's here tonight, who's um, a wonderful friend and incredible artist himself, um, he and I always get made fun of because we are always too busy to make enough work to put in the kiln. I think we do it because we like hanging out with everybody, right? Um, so all of those things that I do, whether it's curating, being in shows, putting together shows, um, going to workshops, running workshops, all of that stuff, teaching for years. I ran a, a craft school in Arizona for seven years, ran a gallery there for three. Um, I've done a lot of different stuff. I've done residencies all over the place. Um, it connects you, and connection to me is the most important thing. Watershed Center for the Ceramic Arts uh, was founded uh, by Chris Gustin and a few other people um, in the 80s, uh, still thriving today, and I sit on the board of that school now, and that school, um, every summer, houses 
some of the, the best artists you'll ever run across, and they work hand in hand with other artists that just want to be there with them. And it gives them time and space to actually work and create um, pieces that they never would have the opportunity to create otherwise. And I just, uh, it changed my life when I went there as a student. I went there as a scholarship student. It really did change my life. Um, reinforced the fact that I wanted to be a potter. And so now to be on the board of that, I can't begin to tell you um, what that's done for me. But the reason I put this slide up is that without watershed, in my opinion at least, none of what's about to happen here in New Bedford would be happening. Um, I'm not saying that's because of me. I'm saying it's all of the intertwining lacing and spider effect of, of what watershed means to people like me. Um, when I was the curator at the art museum, and this was years ago, I had heard rumblings that Enseca was going to go to Providence. The day that I heard that it, it was confirmed that it was, I told my board and my director that we were booking the museum for that time period for a show for Watershed. Um, they agreed, it passed through a few meetings. I'm gonna leave it at that, Jane. Uh, and we, we held strong, and not only is it going to happen, but it's gonna be over the top, it's gonna be wonderful. And then when that show got booked, um, I told Chris, and Chris was like, well, that's great, because I think what I wanna do is do a pre-conference wood firing and we'll just invite all the best wood firers across the country, and we'll have a great time with it. Maybe we'll do a show at my gallery. And then Jim and I and Chris talked, and we said, you know what we should do? Actually, Jim and I really have always wanted to do a response show here at this museum. Um, and we said, well, what better time to do that? So all of that happened in the span of a couple of weeks. I mean, we just kind of all put our heads together. And next thing you know, um, Providence, Rhode Island gets the host city for 2015, and all of our plans come into effect. Now, we made those plans without knowing who was gonna be in charge. Um, Providence is a really great venue, but I, I will tell you it's gonna be tricky, and it is tricky. Um, again, drawing the line to all the things that I've, I've done since I've moved back, um, one of the shows that I curated in Jamestown, uh, the Jamestown Arts Center, um, had a, a lot of really wonderful artists in it, one of whom was, um, uh, the lead instructor, instructor at Salve Regina, who happened to be one of the selected two uh, professors to be the hosts for the Enseca conference. Um, he, uh, because of that show in Jamestown and because of my uh, affiliations with the museums, said, you know, Seth, I need to pick a couple of uh, liaisons to select exhibitions for the 2015 Enseca. Would you like to be one of them? Um, a huge honor. I was excited, although um, knowing what Enseca can do to a marriage and to your psyche. I was a little scared, um, but we persevered and got through it. But it was really a, a wonderful experience that has literally just recently um, happened and finished up, thankfully. And Providence is gonna be great, but there's very little space in Providence. So one of the first challenges that we had is, is well, what are we gonna do here? Um, we have a huge, amazing clay community uh, in New England, especially in, in our little kind of enclave here. Um, so we put our heads together and we decided, uh, between myself and Chris and Jim and a few other people in, in the community here, we decided that we would have our own kind of little mini section of shows and events. And if Enseca wanted to participate in that, that was great. If they didn't want to, we were going to do it anyway. And when they caught wind of it, uh, they were not only excited about it, they really were rooting for us to do a good job putting it together. Um, so they also allowed for us to do the entire pre-conference, which is a huge honor. Um, it's all happening here at this museum. Um, we'll get to that a little bit more in depth, but again, kind of drawing those parallels of all the people that you meet and all the conversations that you have, it all kind of came into place. So what is NSICA? NSICA is the National Conference for the Education of Ceramic Arts. It's a long name. Um, when I was a student many eons ago, and Sika probably drew about 2,000, 2,500 students, and it was a blast. Um, you went because you could watch demonstrations by some of the, uh, the nation's leading ceramic artists, sometimes the world's best street, the ceramic artists. You could get to go to shows um, of artists that you wouldn't normally get to see. This is well before Facebook or a lot of the social media sites, Instagram, all these other things. They didn't exist, so if you didn't go to these things, you didn't see the work. You just didn't know who these people were half the time. So that was the real excitement for me of going to them. 
Um, you'd have gallery talks, and you'd get to actually hear the artists tell you about their work. It's even more important, I think, these days, because you see, you see, you see this with gallery talks. Everyone's recording you. Next thing you know, you have like 17 YouTube videos of your speech or whatever. Um, so I'm always careful, especially with two daughters at home under the age of four. I have learned to not curse. Um, but again, uh, they've even created, so when Sika has really evolved, and it's actually created an app that will guide you through the entire conference, which is great. Um, so we'll actually have maps that people can access on their phone that will send them to New Bedford, that will send them up to Boston, that will send them all over the place. So we were allowed as a team for exhibitions for Inseca to say, we're going to look everywhere. We're going to take every opportunity, and we're going to scout out locations that will take great shows. And we did that. So you literally will leave Providence. You'll make your way to amazing shows in Warren, Rhode Island, Newport, Rhode Island, um, uh, all the way down to Salve, Regina. There's going to be some amazing shows down that way, Jamestown, um, South County, and Kingston. Uh, that hits kind of all the southern uh, Rhode Island locations. Then you're going to work all the way into Fall River. Uh, Jim Lawton is doing a wonderful teapot show at the Narrows Center for the Arts, if you know uh, that location there, um, uh, which thankfully I will be in as well. Way to go, Jim. Um, uh, just an amazing swath of shows leading all the way to New Bedford. Okay? Um, and then you're going to go north and go to the Fuller Craft Museum in Brockton. Bridgewater State University is doing an incredible host of shows all the way up into Boston. I can't even begin to tell you what Boston's doing. Um, but Boston didn't think that they'd be involved at all until we kind of gave them the option. And then Kathy King, who's in part of our show here, um, who runs the Harvard program up in Boston, she really took the reins from that and gathered everyone in Boston and said, we're going to do this. Um, and it's really, it's going to be outstanding. Um, so again, you get to see demos, you get to go to shows, you get to buy tools and products from the vendors that are there all week. It's really an amazing, uh, amazing experience. Um, so who are the players? I kind of mentioned just most of them at this point. RISD and Salve Regina are the two host um, uh, schools. And uh, the Providence as the city is the host city. Um, but again, the players are as far away as the MFA is doing a huge show of their entire ceramics collection. The MFA is responding to Inseca. That's when you know you've made it, right? Um, the Star Store here in New Bedford is doing an amazing alumni show as well as some other shows. The students are really going into the community and taking over a lot of these storefronts and galleries and doing some amazing shows as well. Um, ceramics is everywhere. You know, I love that we have the sergeant and the two vases that are in the sergeant next to the sergeant. It's great. That's this uh, shot on the, on the middle left. Um, it's my favorite thing to go see, to be honest with you. Uh, the Whaling Museum, of course, will be uh, a major player in it, as in the entire festivities of uh, uh, the pre-conference will be happening here. And of course, you would have to fight to get the seventh most artistic city in the country to be involved in the National Ceramics Conference. I still don't know how that happened. First in whatever Jane just said. There you go. Love it. Um, you know, it's funny because when I was in school, Gallery X was where we had our thesis exhibition and we were painting walls because it was crumbling and falling apart and that was the only gallery in town. Sam, you were there, you remember. Um, New Bedford was in rough shape back then and it's come a long, 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 long way and Gallery X looks beautiful now. It's doing great. They're uh, going to be helping out. There's going to be some really great things. You have eateries like Cork and all these other places that the experience when they get here, they're going to be able to stay here and have a great day see incredible shows within walking distance. They're going to get to eat some great food, see some great music. Um, it's, it's going to be outstanding. So if you look at the map on the top right, you're really going to see what I'm talking about when, when we're looking at it as um, and seek a board and we're saying, how are we going to get all these shows booked in? We looked at the map and we said, well, God, New Bedford has all this opportunity, a huge, amazing enclave of ceramic artists that are known nationally. Um, and the space to do these shows. So once we kind of solidified what we were doing, everyone else kind of followed suit. So you have all the way from Rhode Island into New Bedford, all the way up to Boston. So it's kind of this triangle, the Bermuda Triangle of awesomeness, I like to call it. Um, oops, wrong way. Um, so again, our neighbors and partners are really important in this process. Uh, 
Chris Gustin, without him being here, without him having taught at UMass Dartmouth, without him having built that wood kiln, all of these things, having him not be my teacher as well as a thousand other people, um, had Jim not taken his job, um, none of this would have really been in focus. New Bedford probably would not have been thought of at all um, in terms of Nsika in the least. So Dee Dee Shattuck built this incredible gallery out in Westport where she will be housing Chris's uh, show. And it's going to be a beautiful show of brand new work that no one else has ever seen before. Um, I got a glimpse of some of it and it's really going to be ridiculously great. This is the inside of the wood kiln on the bottom left. Um, those pieces are almost as tall as I am, about here. It takes two of us to load them into the kiln. Um, so when I say it's a big kiln, it's really, really big. And you should all come out and see it. Um, so he has a, a gallery on site, which is beautiful. Um, this is the sign on the left here, top left. And so he invited literally just a who's who of ceramic artists that happened to wood fire to come uh, for the symposium. They're going to be firing the wood kiln. I will be as well um, very early in the month um, and then unloading as the, as the conference begins. So it's kind of a great way to go. Ooh, it's like Christmas. This would be great. Uh, so this is a few pictures of, of some of the artists that will be there. It's Matt Long on the bottom left. Um, that's him working on a piece there with a great handlebar mustache I'm very jealous of. Um, Dan Anderson, when I was in school, was one of my heroes, still is. Uh, it's the Gulf Oil um, jar in the middle there, and that's him. He's a wonderful goofball. Um, Jen McKay, McKay is on the uh, bottom right. Um, that piece actually was uh, in the, the New Bedford Art Museum Collector's Show few years ago. Um, uh, Randy Johnston in the middle, uh, again, always has been one of my all-time favorite artists. Uh, he's coming, it was really a coup that, that he said yes um, to coming out. Um, some really wonderful, powerful uh, women in the field. Uh, someone like Ashwini Bhatt, who's on the top right. Um, she's a real up-and-comer in the field, and um, uh, she comes from India to come fire with us and does amazing work. Um, she's going to be there as well. Um, here's Chris in the middle, working on a large piece. His good friend and, and, and certainly has become one of mine, uh, Arnie Zimmerman on the right, a lot of years ago. He would love that I'm showing you that picture. Um, uh, Doug Caseburn on the bottom right, and John Balistrieri on the bottom left. John, you can actually see standing there, so you get an idea how big that kiln is and how big those pieces are. All of those artists you just saw are going to be speaking here, lecturing here, and demo demonstrating here for the pre-conference festivities in March. Um, so of course, uh, the collection that's here is just, I can't begin to tell you the amount of information um, that artists can gather from this museum. Um, granted, there might not be a ton of ceramics on display here at any one given time. Um, the amount of information that's here for three-dimensional objects, for makers, um, is, is, is beyond uh, compare. Um, I've been looking a ton at these boat models, the patterning in them, uh, the lines that the, the, the ropes make, um, that light blue and the boats with the oars that look like little matchsticks. I can't begin to tell you, I don't even know what's going to happen, but I know that's inspiring me to do something. Um, these uh, kind of boat models and the shadow boxes um, have echoed in the theater cups that I'm making. Um, the scrimshaw canes, I can't even begin, to, I want to cry every time I go in that room. Um, so really, uh, what's happening here is that we are putting together a show. Um, what Jim and I did is we came up with a list of, how many artists, it was like 22 or something? Artists uh, that we thought would be great to work with this collection. And Christina Connett, we gave her the information, we met with her and James Russell, and said, here are the artists that we think um, we would love to do this. I don't know how many artists you think would work, what space we could have, etc. Uh, we settled on these eight. Um, and it's very exciting. It's an amazing group. We're really, really fortunate here to have this group. So I'm going to show you each of those artists and tell you a little bit about them. Chris Archer, um, uh, a dear friend, he's a total goofball. He might be the only person on the planet that's not on Facebook. Um, he's an incredible, incredible artist. Um, he wor works up in New Hampshire. He's the only non-Massachusetts artist in this show. Um, New Hampshire Institute for the Arts uh, up in New Hampshire. He teaches there uh, and is a wonderful maker. He comes down um, often to fire with us at the wood kiln. Um, 
He's a, a very, very astute gentleman that um, not only can cook like the wind, uh, but can talk through uh, any of the issues as, as makers that we have today. He's really in tune with that, and I, I love him for it. This piece that you're, you're seeing on the right is actually a terracotta tile floor that he installed at the show I did in Jamestown a while back that was about 30 feet long, and you actually could walk on it. And because each piece is different than, than the next, he installs it differently every time he does it. And you actually do walk on it, and it's very disconcerting in how your feet move. But by the time you get to the end, it's almost like you've got a foot massage. So he wants you to experience and feel a little daring and feel like things aren't going to quite work out. But by the time you get to the end, you feel pretty good about yourself. Um, I always love showing um, these little handheld objects that he puts together. On the middle left, they're very, very small little porcelain objects that he puts on this metal tray. And that metal tray is then put on homemade paper. Every time I see that piece, and I've, I've seen it in two different shows, I expect it to make noise. I expect it to be really fragile, and it's none of those things. It's perfectly silent because of that paper. The porcelain is actually quite heavy. Those objects are very, very heavy, and they don't look like they should be. So he's just messing with you. It's like his barbecue. It's like, how do you get that taste? And then he'll say, root beer. It's like, oh, I should have known that. Um, so he just really has this wonderful mind, and he, he likes to engage people in a process that is unexpected. Um, I have no idea what he's going to do, and I can't wait. Mary Beringer is, is really a, a, an icon to me in the field, um, a very powerful woman in, in my estimation, knows more about the history of ceramics than just about anybody. Um, we'll talk your ear off about it if you give her a chance to. Um, the thing I've always loved most about Mary's work is if you get a chance to touch it. Um, the surface is so rich and so buttery and almost like wax. Um, the, the act of, I have two of her plates, and the act of eating off of those makes me smile just ridiculously. And to wash them, you put them under the water, and you're just done. Something about the surface of those plates just makes you want to eat good food. And obviously, I have eaten good food. Um, but her work is very generous. It's very gentle. Um, she's a very generous and gentle soul. Um, she uses a lot of geometries, very simple uh, line making that is not very simple to do. Uh, Cynthia Constantino uh, has been one of my favorites for a very long time. Um, she's a, a figurative artist that really explores um, identities that, uh, again, are kind of in your face, but she does it in a very unassuming way most of the time, although sometimes she'll have a little girl holding an Uzi uh, and an army helmet. Um, uh, she really explores the depths of emotion, uh, childhood rearing, um, all these things. Um, you could see, I like showing uh, artists working in their studios. The piece that she's working on there in the top left uh, gives you an idea of the scale of the objects that she's making. They're generally child size. Um, sometimes these smaller figures on the bottom left, a little figurine, 12 inch, 14 inch, somewhere in there. Um, I know she's very excited. Uh, she's visited the museum already to come up with information. So each of these artists have been given free reign of this museum even the uh, apartment that they have at the Wamsutta uh, apartments. I, don't know, I didn't know that until they told me that if you have an artist coming from far and wide and they want to stay for a weekend, we have an apartment for them. Well, if you're a potter, that's about the best thing you could ever hear. Um, so a few of them have taken advantage of that from what I hear, which is wonderful. Uh, Molly Hatch is uh, wonderful. I, I can't say up and coming anymore. She's coming and is still really cranking it out. Um, I'm happy to say uh, I carried her at, at my gallery here in New Bedford before she blew up, but she's now carried by Anthropology. Um, her collection can be found at Anthropology. She does amazing work. Um, uh, she teaches at RISD, which again is the host school for, um, for the conference. Uh, she was in the Blue and White show at the MFA this past summer, which was amazing. She did a huge plate wall, um, and she's planning on doing a big plate wall here. So we're incredibly fortunate to have that coming. Um, she does incredible narrative work, beautiful decorative work. She looks at history and historical objects all the time. So this couldn't have been a better show for her to be involved in. Um, Kathy King is the one I was telling you about who runs the program at Harvard. She really is the catalyst for Boston really getting involved with uh, the National Ceramics Conference um, in 2015. 
uh, just again, um, this show is filled with some of my favorite people. They just all have wonderful attitudes, wonderful educators, wonderful people to talk with. Um, they're going to be very giving of their time. Um, all of these artists in this show will be wandering through the museums giving gallery talks at different times over the course of the two days of the symposium. So to explain a little further what we're going to be doing is we're going to be responding to some of the objects within the collection, making new works based on those objects. Um, and potentially, the pieces that we make will be set in with the collection as you wander through the museum. The rest of the pieces will be then housed in the gallery upstairs so that you'll see a, a kind of cohesive show of the process. But then you'll be walked through the, the collection and you'll see these objects, these contemporary objects, next to 200-year-old objects, which could be wonderful. So it's going to be amazing. The docents, get ready. I'm warning you. Okay. Um, so Kathy King does what we call scraffito. Scraffito is the Italian word for scratch. Um, so what she does, uh, it's almost the opposite of how I make, make work. She lays down a blanket of black on top of porcelain and then scratches back to the porcelain to create line. Okay, if you've ever done scratch board with black and white, it's kind of the same thing but in clay. Um, she uh, is visiting tomorrow from what I hear. And I can't wait to see what she comes up with. Yes. You know, everyone assumes that, that I have been inspired by it. I can't say I haven't been, but it's never in my f front of my f lobe, and n nor with her. It, but her head's going to explode when she sees the collection. I'll guarantee that. When, when, when you see the surface of those pieces, they're almost like woodblock. Yeah, or linoleum cut, yeah. Linoleum yeah. They're, they're kind of, uh, very yeah. Yeah, and there's... Um, uh, uh, my friend Jose is, is uh, blind and um, he loves touching my work and he, he tries to feel you know where the drawings are and whatnot and my surfaces are not raised very much um, so it's not nearly as fun um, but I have a couple of Kathy Kings and he just can't stop he'll come over and talk up a storm and he's not paying attention to me at all he's just rubbing down covered jars um, but her work's just exquisite um, I love especially the king, king size bed, Kathy King, Kathy King size bed. Um, wonderful work, wonderful sense of humor, but also can be very dark and, and uh, pretty controversial in some of the stuff that she's done. Um, so she might be one to watch out for in terms of uh, kind of the uh, way that she can manipulate uh, imagery to send a different message. Um, I, I got to say this, even though I'm friends with some of the best uh, ceramic artists in, in, the, in the country. Uh, this is my favorite contemporary ceramic artist and I was really really happy um, when the million channels we had to go through to get him to say yes, he did uh, say yes um, and from what I hear went ballistic um, when he visited the collection and really is excited um, to I guess as he said go dark, is that it? Yeah, can't wait. What, whatever that means I can't wait to see it. Um, these heads that you see are ginormous. The, the bases of them would fit on this table and they would stand to about here. Um, they're amazing and the, the detail that he gets in them are, are outlandish. Um, they're always very, very charged, um, sometimes politically, certainly sexually. Um, he's meticulous. His quality of mark making, I still don't even understand how he gets it uh, to be the way it is. When you see the works in person, you, you seriously will, will lose it. Um, he really is an outstanding artist. He's out in um, uh, Western Mass. Um, is a huge, huge name in the field now. Um, sells incredibly well. He's just one of those guys that uh, is just gold. Really just a, uh, uh, what I consider to be uh, the, the best contemporary ceramist out there right now. And then this guy named Jim Lawton. Um, you know, moving home, I didn't really know Jim all that well, but uh, within about two seconds we became good friends and uh, I love Jim to death. Um, and it was really an honor to be able to work with him um, to put all of this together and to help the museum be a big player uh, in this uh, event. Jim, I, I believe, is responding with some wall pieces primarily. 
I'm not going to say yet. No, no, no. I love it. Jim wants it to be a surprise. Uh, Jim has been incredibly successful in the field. He runs the UMass Dartmouth Ceramics program after Chris left um, and has continued to propel that program um, to be one of the best in the country. Um, some of my favorite pieces, he's done this wonderful gear tile system that he has, uh, this wall installation on the, on the left um, that you see. Um, it's a pain in the ass to install. No offense, Jim, but it's a beautiful piece. Um, his pots, I, I grew up adoring and, and, and loved. Not to age you, Jim, but I did study your work in college. Um, the t bottom teapot, uh, the very bottom, are really what kind of landed Jim on the map, these wonderful raku pieces. We'd have uh, floating tables and cups and wonderful things. And um, when I knew that we were responding to this collection here, I wondered if this was going to eke its way back into Jim's uh, bag of tricks. And I'm, I'm kind of hoping it does. But um, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful work. Uh, exquisite detail, uh, functional objects um, that may teeter on the visual edge of non-function. And I think that's a, a really strong um, statement for, for makers um, out there. Um, anyone can make something conceptual, um, but it's really difficult to make something conceptual that still functions. Um, and Jim plays into that perfectly. Um, Averse Sea and Fire, a Symposium of Makers, is the official title. Thank you, Jim. Um, March 21st and 22nd of 2015, OK? So it happens before the conference. The conference is itself happens on March 25th through the 28th. Um, so again, at the beginning of the month, the wood firing with all those wonderful wood fire ceramic artists will happen out at Chris Gustin's place. Everyone is invited to come out and watch and experience it. Um, there's no bad time to come, whether you come at 3 o'clock in the morning. It's actually really fun to come then. Um, or you come at 8 o'clock in the morning, or you come at noon and enjoy the lunch that we all make. By the way, all potters are good cooks. Um, I don't know what it is, but it's true. Um, so these are all the artists. Um, if, if anyone wants to write them down or even take a picture of this on your phones, you just Google these artists and you'll start to see the, the actual candy that will be created. Uh, Chris Archer, Dan Anderson, John Balstrary, Mary Beringer, Cynthia Constantino, Doug K. Spear, Chris Gustin, Molly Hatch, Sergey Isipov, Randy Johnston, Kathy King, Jim Lawton, Matt Long, Jamie Cahey, Seth Rainville, and Arnie Zimmerman. Um, all here for two days, lecturing, gallery talks, showing you the works that they've created or bringing you out to the kiln to show you the works that they've done over there, um, talking to you about their careers, showing you um, the processes. That's what I really can't wait for. The demonstrations um, start to break things down. Sometimes you'll see something being made and you're like, you're kidding me, that's it? And you get angry and you say to yourself, I can do that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go buy a wheel. Um, and other things that you think are so simple, like a mug, by the time you're done, you're sweating and you're like, you, you can't be serious. That took that long. Um, and then you won't wonder anymore why certain things are charged the way they are. If I hear one more time, who would spend $1,800 on a teapot? I'd be like, well, spend 18 hours on a teapot and you'll know why. Um, so here's a little glimpse into what I'm doing for you here. Um, this is the, um, the thrown and finished beginning of an oil baler, which is one of the objects next to the, um, the ship on the wall. You'll see all these wonderful, what I called sticks with buckets on them. And I was like, these are awesome, what are they? So I investigated and found out they were oil balers and saw these great images of these guys taking whale oil with these giant spigots and pouring them off. I was like, I love that. And no one's doing that with these. What would I do with them? Olive oil, it's a lot of olive oil. This is uh, this bucket. If you see my wheel, if you know what a potter's wheel looks like, it's you know, dwarfing my wheel. It's big, it's, I don't know, wet, 16 inches tall. Um, and that opening is where um, one of the three trees that fell down in my yard during the last hurricane um, has been chopped up into small branches and I've been burning a little bit at a time. I set aside some of the nicest ones that I've whittled down and cleaned up and those will be the handles for them. So I'm making a series of them. Um, this particular one is not in porcelain, but uh, some of them will be. And these, this is the initial drawing I had done in my studio um, of what I wanted to make. 
So you see the drawing on the top left and the piece that's coming into focus on the bottom right and left. And the drawing in the middle is from the archive here. So that uh, almost last one from the bottom is the one I'm really responding to, is that kind of bucket on a stick. And last but not least, I just want to, um, the Whaling Museum and the staff here, some of whom are here tonight, and Connie especially, um, has been just amazing, uh, not only hosting our artists, making us all feel at home, but never saying no. There hasn't been a single no to anything we've wanted to do yet. I know it can be pretty convincing, but that's ridiculous. Um, and it really, they're, they're pouring their heart and soul into it. One of the things I really want to mention, um, and I'm going to make this brief and not my typical spiel, because um, I'd feel bad if I did that to you. Um, but we really need to raise awareness of how important this is to this community, the local businesses, and everything that will benefit from this, this museum primarily. The works that are going to be made from this show will be absolute one of a kinds, will never happen again. And I would hate to see this museum not have the opportunity to acquire these objects. So one of the main things that the museum is trying to do, not only to pay our artists to be here through this symposium, but is to try to acquire some of these objects. So we're doing everything in our power to raise funds um, to bolster uh, the kitty um, so that we can do that um, and, and, and get some of these objects, especially with the new building being built the contemporary collection is starting to take off here at the museum. Um, this is a golden opportunity. And we have less than a year, much less than a year, um, to do that. So uh, we're going to have some fundraisers coming up um, so you get something out of it and enjoy yourself. If you want soup bowl supper, it's a little kind of an upscale version of that. We're going to do um, some limited edition drawn plates that I'll be doing that will um, sell. We haven't come up with a final price on those yet. Um, but that fundraiser alone where we're going to have, I believe, because it's going to be in January, end of January, 24th, 25th, somewhere in there. Yeah, that um, it'll be on the website as soon as we figure it all out. Um, we're going to have uh, maybe some mimosas and some brunch and a wonderful meal. Um, and we'll auction off these plates. We'll do some silent auctioning of some wonderful ceramics by some of the artists that will be in the show. Um, and hopefully, again, give you a good time let you experience some of these objects, garner some of these objects before anyone else has a chance to do so, um, and really be able to fund this not only for the museum's sake, but for the artist's sake. Um, the artists that are doing this, including myself, never get paid this little to do something like this. The amount of money that we would get paid to do a two-day symposium is not what is happening, because we have so many artists doing this. They've all agreed to do this for a minimal money, not even enough money to cover their travel here. Um, so it's, it's great that they've all done that, but we still have to pay that bill and then again raise some money to be able to um, help out the museum. So if there's anything, I'm not saying for you to break out your checkbook grant out right now, but you can. Um, but if you know of anyone that would love to support this, please let us know. Um, if you yourself, uh, you know, $20, $50, $100, I don't care, um, donation of anything resources, um, catering, etc. anything. We would love to talk to you. This is something that is really a once in a lifetime. If it didn't happen since 1984, now it's 2015, none of us are going to be around for the next time it's around here. So let's do it right. Okay. So thank you to everyone, all the local businesses, um, and Sika especially for giving the really the ridiculous amount of trust for us to be doing all of this for them. We're not the host city and yet we're doing all kind of the most important stuff for them. Um, so it's really, really wonderful, and I, I can't thank you all enough for being here. Um, and I hope uh, if you have any questions that you'll take a second to ask me, because I'd love to answer some. Thank you. Yes? I'm wondering why you are uh, focused so much on the teapot. What was the... It's a great question. It's a pretty simple answer. I don't drink tea. <laughs> <laughs> I've owned a coffee shop. I'm an avid coffee drinker. I was even rushed to the hospital for caffeine overdose. Um, Teapots, however, uh, again, my teacher said to me when I was in college, and as a former avid athlete, um, I love challenges, and I love being told not to do something. Now my daughter has learned that same thing genetically. Wonderful. Um, he basically said, teapots are the hardest object to make perfectly. 
They hold everything about making pots that's difficult to do. Pouring, fulcrum, handles, rims, feet, all of it. Everything that's hard about making pots is contained in a teapot. So do them well, and you'll be able to make anything else you want. So I sat down, and I made 100 teapots, and most of them stunk. They would did the glug, glug, glug when you poured them. You know, so basically, as they came out, I would take water, fill them up, and pour them. If they didn't pour, I'd smash them with a hammer and throw them away and start over. Um, you don't realize in school that that's a stupid thing to do. Um, but it was very smart for me because I just I learned not to hold visual art too uh, strong in my soul, not to be able to move, move beyond that. So now I make teapots that still function perfectly. It might be cut in half. It might be a theater of the absurd, but still can pour a perfect cup of tea for you. And that's really important to me. Um, and I just think teapots are graceful. I think they're wonderful. There's nothing about that form that I don't appreciate and love. Um, I've investigated culturally all the different variations and uh, tea drinking, tea ceremony. Uh, Mr. Sam Barrows here actually taught me a ton about uh, tea when I was in school. We visited his wonderful little store that was in New Bedford where he was making incredible, that machine still haunts me. It's awesome. Um, I just had a great education in teapot making and tea as, as a culture, um, and it's never left me. It's something I love to do. Okay. Thank you, everyone. It's an exciting time. Yes? What's the easiest way to follow this in terms of ordering tickets. Thank you. That's a great question. Um, the Whaling Museum is doing a great job of getting ready to do all of that on its own website. But Inseca also is doing a great job of that. So there's two ways I would say um, that would be the best ways. Joining Inseca as a, a community is only $55. So once you belong to Inseca, you can come to the symposium for $10 cheaper. You get all the updates and the emails, all of that. So it's not a bad idea to do that. And you're supporting all of the students that are starving out there that want to come to this thing. Um, so that's a really easy way. Uh, Facebook is a huge resource because not only is Inseca on Facebook, but every artist that's involved in it is. And that's where the wealth of information is shared. Except the first one. Yes. Yeah, except Chris Archer, which we all give hell. It's funny because I'll post stuff for him. And he's like, how did so-and-so know that I was doing this? I'm like, Facebook. Oh, OK. Um, he's not a big fan of social media. So Nsika has a, a website that we can just... Absolutely. Yep, nsika.org. Yep. It's yep. not totally set up, though, because I just looked at it yesterday, and there's still sort of some of that stuff isn't quite up yet. Well, what happens is when last year's ends, then they have to reset for the new coming year. So all of that is kind of the transitioning is happening. Yeah, it, but you can buy memberships on there. Is, um, is there a newsletter? Do you know that? I mean, an email newsletter that they would send out if you... Oops. Once you're a member, yeah, you'll, you'll get that information. Yep. Um, and even if you're not a member, if you just check the website, you know, repeatedly. Um, but again, the Whaling Museum, is UMass Dartmouth going to do anything, Jim? Well, we're, um, they're, we're doing a number of things. So, I mean, collectively. Yeah. Like, we're uh, going to create a map of uh, all the exhibitions sort of out this way. Yep. Right. You know, you mentioned Gallery X. Our, the grad students are, you know, putting on a, you know, a, a show there, and there'll be pop-up shows. Yeah, was, the whole place is going to be one big ceramic but salad. <laughs> Yeah, you'll probably be sick of hearing about it. <laughs>
Right. Yeah. Well, when we juried shows, there's 82 shows on the books between Boston to Providence, down in Newport. That's a ton of shows. Well, the amazing thing is, is the farther we got with the show here, the more excited James and Christina and Connie and everyone got. Next thing you know, we're, we're going all the way through the summer. So we're opening in March what? You have those dates. February now, that's right. We decided February something. But it's going to run for, I mean, so, and uh, what's going to happen is Connie, along with a few other people, are going to curate the, that smaller gallery at the front. What's the name of that one? Upstairs? The Water Street Gallery? Either way, it's a smaller gallery upstairs. Water Street Gallery, okay. Um, the contemporary, uh, I mean, the, the ceramics collection that is housed by the Whaling Museum will be curated into there as kind of a secondary um, view of what we're doing. So that'll be really exciting as well. But the resources are, are endless in terms of what you can hear. Um, I'd be happy to give you my card. You know, I'll, I'll send you whatever information you want. <laughs> Uh, yeah, sure. sure. That's I think Chris would love that, actually. <laughs> well, let me say this. It's not bad form to bring it. It's bad form to um, use that as a device to annoy anyone for a length of time. <laughs> but with wood kilns, um, the, the rules change so dramatically in wood kilns because you have to be so on top of everything every minute and we do eight hour shifts at a time. So when you have the midnight to 8 a.m. shift, you're not human. It's like Lord of the Flies by 8 a.m. Um, and showing up at 8 a.m. to talk to the night crew doesn't give you a true measure of who they are as people. <laughs> so if you showed up then with a log book, that might be a bad idea. <laughs> oh, a log, bring a log. Oh, that would be very cool. Yeah, we actually had a, I thought you meant a kiln log, which is what we do to track firings. <laughs> yeah, yep. yeah, it's in South Dartmouth, right off of Horse Neck Road. Oh, we won't be firing here. Images within yeah. the lectures and whatnot, sure, yeah, yeah. Everybody fires in different, uh, different, like, you know, all the work won't be firing yeah. from all the artists. Right. Right. Yeah. So some people might have a lectures down, some people might have a lectures down. Oh, lots of pictures, yeah, so absolutely. Yeah. Right, right. right. Wisconsin. India, Florida, <laughs> Mississippi. Yep. Yeah. 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 I think. And there's more than just those eight firing the kiln. Those are just the eight we selected to do the demos with us here. The, the list is exponentially larger. Um, and so his gallery there is housing shows of all the people like myself, Jim, et cetera, that have been helping with that kiln for years. Some exquisite work. And then the rest of it is going to be work made by those artists. So this is going to be it's just, I can't begin to tell you the shows that are going to be on display. It's going to be great. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you so much.